uh, what we're going to be doing today <coughs> me, is we're going to be covering uh, ethics in the psychology of learning. So this is going to begin our final week of classes where we delve into the ethics of uh, doing what we do. So I mentioned before that this course is one of the most powerful courses here in the sense that uh, after you're done this course, you are ready to go out and apply these behavioral modification techniques to yourself, to others. So we're gonna spend this last week to make sure that you use your powers for good rather than evil. Um, but before we get to that, we do have to wrap up uh, biological dispositions in learning. We're gonna take a look at uh, activity anorexia. So what we're going to do today is we're going to finish up our look at biological dispositions and behavior by taking a look at uh, activity anorexia. And then uh, we are going to introduce the idea of the ethical principles uh, of psychologists, uh, just a general uh, guideline for the code of conduct. We're going to mention very briefly the idea of speciesism. So uh, it is another one of those isms where we judge uh, animals differently uh, than humans, and we'll briefly discuss uh, the issues along with that. And then finally, we'll uh, take a look at uh, some specific guidelines for the ethical conduct in the care and use of uh, non-human uh, animals in research. So if you do research on animal psychology, for example, uh, there are rules and guidelines that go in. So we'll briefly mention those. We won't spend too much time on that because you do have that uh, for your readings. Uh, you do have that in the notes that you can peruse through it. But we'll talk about the point of all these uh, rules, and then we're going to take a look at the movie White Dog, the first uh, half of it. And this is a, I, I choose this movie for, for two reasons. Number one, it probably, outside of one little concept that it tries to squeeze in there, I think, for dramatic purposes, it's probably one of the most psychologically accurate displays of learning. Uh, in a movie, so you will see just about everything that we've gone through uh, this semester. You'll see operant conditioning, you'll see classical conditioning, you'll see discriminative stimuli for reinforcement, they'll mention spontaneous conditioning, they'll go through extinction, they'll go through intermittent, um, uh, intermittent uh, uh, reinforcement. They basically, uh, it's a very uh, scientifically accurate portrayal of learning, but it also is a very dramatic example of what happens when ethics are violated. So one of the things that ethics does is it protects people. And what it protects is it protects individuals that you do psychology with and it protects the psychologists themselves. And we're going to see what happens when those protections are ignored. Uh, it leads to very harmful situations. schedule for today, so let's dive in. So last time, just kind of recap, we were looking at uh, biological dispositions and behavior, and we were mentioning how it's important to learn these because, and learn about these things, because it's what separates a true psychologist from just a well-intentioned individual. And one of the challenges in psychology is that oftentimes people think that it's rather straightforward. They think that it's rather uh, obvious because most of the examples in pop culture of mental illness, of um, mental disorders, uh, tend to be rather obvious. So we mentioned that Rapunzel, you know, if her or any other Disney princesses ever needed counseling, it would take you all of about two minutes to know that it was Mother Gothel gaslighting her and kidnapping her and Stockholm syndroming her and just doing all those things that led to her maladaptive uh, behavior. And uh, this would be true, as we mentioned, of just about every, uh, almost every princess. Uh, and again, we know that because that is not the correct response to finding a girl, uh, a little girl, in your dressing room. So uh, we're now going to turn to activity anorexia. And just as a sort of warning here, this does contain uh, some rather intense images because it does deal with uh, anorexia nervosa. 
and uh, that is just not, um, you know, not a pleasant sight. So, anorexia nervosa, we see an example here, is a uh, mental disorder. Uh, it's an eating disorder. It's a mental illness. It affects uh, both females and males as well. And uh, what we're going to see today is a potential cause of um, anorexia that is oftentimes, again, not covered by the media. So usually when people think of anorexia, and people think of individuals suffering from anorexia, oftentimes they think of you know, the pressures of society to look a certain way, they think of body images uh, being portrayed in the media, they think of overbearing parents and their influence on their children, the striving for perfection, all that kind of, um, all those uh, factors. And it's true that those factors do contribute. However, sometimes you will find instances where those factors are not contributing. Those factors are not the causes, and yet you still have an individual suffering from anorexia. And again, the question is, as a clinical psychologist, what do you do in that instance? And the answer is, you go to your training, you go to your, uh, your education, and you find an answer. And the answer, in some cases, might just be activity anorexia. So activity anorexia, this is an anorexic, uh, uh, this is an, a type of anorexia that is uh, associated with an abnormally high level of activity. So you have an abnormally high level of activity and a low level of food intake. So you have both of those uh, symptoms together. And it was uh, generated by exposure to a restricted schedule of feeding. So that is uh, what causes both this increase in activity and this decrease in the actual levels of food intake. So you end up with a high level of activity, a high level, high level of calories being uh, expended. You end up with an organism that has low levels of food intake, and this was just generated by a restrictive, a restrictive schedule of feeding. So what they did, or how this was discovered, is they were testing out different windows of feeding on, uh, on rats. So they would allow rats to have access to food for different amounts of times uh, per day. And what they found was that when that schedule of feeding was restricted um, to a certain extent, not only would rats all of a sudden increase their levels of activity by a massive amount, so they would run, uh, they would run uh, incessantly on their uh, running wheel, but also when the food finally was available, they would eat less of it. And that restrictive window, that sort of your food is only available for four hours out of the day or two hours out of the day, that restrictive window in and of itself was what caused these uh, anorexic symptoms. So this activity anorexia, high levels of um, activity, low level of food intake, just generated by that restrictive schedule of feeding. And this kind of knowledge, again, is what we're looking for as psychologists, because again, if somebody comes to you and they're suffering from anorexia, you might run through the list of causes, and you might go through that checklist of the most common causes, and it might be no, 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 no. So, you know, do you have an unsupportive mother? It's like, no, my mother loves me exactly the way that I am. Oh, do you uh, expose yourself to, you know, um, unrealistic body images? And it's like, no, I you know, don't have any social media whatsoever. Oh, do you have this? Do you have this? You might go through the entire checklist and they have none of the typical causes. It's at that point that you have to remember your training and ask them, do you have, for some reason, a restrictive uh, schedule of feeding? And it might be at that time when you're asking yourself, all right, I've gone through the checklist, let me ask them then, this, do you have a restrictive schedule of feeding? Like, did something change in your life where you now only have access to food for a certain amount of time? And they might admit, oh yeah, I got this very, very fulfilling job, but I am busy all the time. And there are days when, you know, I get to my work and I'll skip lunch and I'll skip dinner because I'm just so busy. And by the time I come home to eat, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I don't have much time before I need to go to bed. And they love their job, and they're fulfilled in their job, but what their job is doing is giving them a restrictive schedule of feeding. 
And that restrictive schedule of feeding might be enough to have them jack up their high level of it, their level of activity, and when they are able to eat, decrease their food intake. And for no other reason than that, they might reach anorexic levels of, uh, of weight. So uh, this was um, a potential, so this was discovered in animal models of, uh, of uh, studies, so they were studying rats, but they also delved deeper into the characteristics of it, and interestingly, they found some similarities to anorexia nervosa, the anorexia that occurs uh, in humans. So we'll run through some of those similarities just to kind of show you once again the, the usefulness of animal models to understand what's going on uh, with humans as well. So uh, much like in humans, uh, in activity um, anorexia and in anorexia nervosa, this increase in activity is typically followed by a decrease in food intake. So we naturally have this mechanism, mechanisms in our body, where counterintuitively, if we increase our activity, we will naturally decrease our desire for food intake, and vice versa. If we decrease our food intake, we will naturally increase our levels of activity. So those two things went together in the rats that were suffering from anorexia nervosa. Those two things go together in humans as well. So I mentioned this one because I've experienced this. This is a, this is a regular mechanism. So it's not just for people that are suffering from anorexia nervosa. This is a mechanism that people, uh, that humans have uh, just in general. So for anybody here that is trying to go to the gym more often, but you simply cannot find the desire to go to the gym, you just find it hard to motivate yourself to go to the gym, this gives you one possibility of uh, increasing your motivation for the gym, and that is to decrease your food intake. So if you just can't find the willpower to go to the gym, try decreasing your food intake, and that will naturally trigger this mechanism that will make you want to be more active. We just have that built in, it's a biological disposition. On the other hand, let's say that you're having trouble decreasing your food intake, or, or eating clean, controlling uh, your diet. Well, in that case, increase your activity. Start working out more, and you will activate this mechanism that will then make it easier for you to control your food intake. And I say I experience this personally. I have a diet that I try to follow. I have a workout schedule that I try to follow. And when I follow my workout schedule, it is easy to follow my diet. And when I follow my diet, I am motivated to work out. But on the days that I take off, those are the days that I binge. And I don't, and it's that mechanism, it's in there. So you don't have to experience it to this level, but we all have it inside. So. Once again, for your own personal uh, goals, uh, you can use what you learn in here to uh, amplify those, uh, those possibilities. All right, next, uh, we got similarities. Uh, individuals who engage in high levels of activity are at higher risk for uh, anorexia. So that was another thing that they found in the rats, and that was another thing that they found in human beings as well. Uh, humans that are generally more active are at a higher risk for developing uh, anorexia. Uh, this one was the one that really kind of stuck out to me. Um, activity anorexia, anorexia in rats, and anorexia nervosa are more common in adolescents. So it just, this goes against all the sort of typically believed uh, narratives of anorexia nervosa that fit into what we believe. So, for example, there's a large uh, body of research that goes into the body images that are presented in our society. It goes into the type of images that people are exposed to day in and day out and day in as a contributing factor to anorexia nervosa. However, that cannot be the only thing because adolescent rats are not scrolling Facebook and looking at their other adolescent rats and wondering why don't they have the body of that other adolescent rat, not realizing that that other adolescent rat is photoshopping all their posts and presenting their best selves, right? They don't have all those other factors. So if we really want to help people and understand what anorexia nervosa 
really involved, part of it, for sure, and there's research to back this up, is that idea of how we present images of bodies in our media. But something like this indicates it cannot be the only factor because rats are developing anorexia, activity anorexia, more commonly in adolescents, like in humans, more commonly in adolescents, and it can't be any of those social media factors, um, so there has to be another aspect to it. So it's a nice little reminder to try to get a complete understanding of behavior and not just uh, go for the intuitively um, uh, obvious or intuitively satisfying results. All right, and uh, oh, this is another one. In, in individuals with activity anorexia and in individuals with anorexia nervosa, they're actually very interested in food. So it's not that they try to avoid food, they try to avoid eating food, but they will show extra interest in food. They will show extra, you know, they'll want to see it, they'll want to, uh, uh, to smell it, they'll want to read about it, they'll want to watch, you know, Nailed It and Sugar Rush and all those cooking shows. Um, same thing with rats. The rats were shown to still be very interested in food. They just lowered their food intake. All right, so that is the, uh, the wrap up on uh, biological dispositions of behavior. And once again, this just as a sort of reminder is why we're all sitting here today to learn how to help individuals. It's not enough to be intuitive. It's not enough to be caring. This is nothing that anybody I think would ever think of naturally given our information in our society. But as psychologists, it's our responsibility to know this information so that when the time comes, we can actually help individuals <coughs> with their behavior issues. All right, so any final questions on activity anorexia or biological dispositions? turn it over to ethics. So what we're going to do today uh, for ethics is we're going to very briefly kind of touch on uh, the five general ethical principles and then we'll discuss speciesism and then we'll um, uh, take a look at probably we'll, at that point we'll have to turn it over to the movie because I do want to get to a certain point uh, so that we can think about it over the next couple of days. But um, in terms of the ethical principles of psychologists and your code of conduct, Oftentimes in psychology, you're presented with new situations and you might ask yourself, what should I do? What's the right thing to do? What's the best thing to do? What's the ethical thing to do in this situation? And to help that, the uh, American Psychological Association, the APA, they have given out five principles that are these general principles for how every psychologist should act. So it doesn't matter if you're a clinical psychologist, experimental psychologist, school psychologist, uh, animal psychologists, these apply to all psychologists. So they're um, listed um, in terms of, some would argue, order of importance. Definitely that first one there is the big one. It's the big guiding umbrella idea that, uh, that informs all the rest. So we'll take a look at that principle A first. So principle A is beneficence and non-maleficence. And what that basically says is that as a psychologist, you strive to benefit those that you work with and you take care to do no harm. So you're basically trying to do what's best for the individual and you take care to do no harm to the individual or minimize any harm to the individual because you can't always not harm an individual. So for example, a great example of that is Harry. Harry literally had to be harmed as part of his uh, as part of his treatment, but that was balanced with the great benefit that was accrued to him from not being self-injurious. So we try to benefit those that we work with and we take care to do no harm, that's principle A. Principle B, fidelity and responsibility. So psychologists establish uh, or try to establish uh, relationships of trust with those that they work with. This is a especially difficult uh, as a psychologist because psychologists have a history of using experimental deception and uh, basically there is the um, view in our society, the trope of the sort of manipulative psychologist, 
the psychologist who is sitting there in the chair while you're in the on the couch telling them about your life story and they're secretly judging you and they're secretly manipulating your behavior. So we kind of have to work twice as hard as other professions to establish those um, relationships of trust. But it is important to, number one, establish those. And then also, number two, to be aware of your uh, professional uh, responsibilities, your scientific responsibilities to the society and the specific communities in which you work. So we do have a responsibility here to South Bend. We do have a responsibility here to this university. And we have a responsibility to psychology in general uh, to do our best um, work and our ethical work. Principle C, integrity. Psychologists seek to promote accuracy, honesty, and truthfulness in the science, teaching, and practice of psychology. So that one is pretty self-explanatory. You do your best to be as truthful as uh, possible. So when you're reporting science, uh, scientific research, you report it accurately. You don't intentionally defraud uh, the reading public. When I'm teaching here, uh, I try to teach as honestly as I possibly can. I don't teach anything that I know is false. Uh, so again, that is principle C, uh, the principle of integrity. Principle D is the principle of justice. And that is basically that uh, psychology, uh, um, psychologists try to allow all uh, persons access to their psychological knowledge, all, all persons to be beneficial or benefited from their psychological knowledge. Uh, and that there's an equal quality in how you interact with uh, everybody. So as a professor, for example, I don't teach students differently based on whether they're part of one group or another group. Um, now, this, uh, this does not mean that you are unethical. If you're a child psychologist and you basically say, I'm going to focus on children, so if you're over 18, you know, I'm sorry, but I can't help you. That's just the nature of spe uh, specializing in certain areas. But it does mean that if you are a child psychologist, all children should be able to benefit from the work that you do. So we're not racist, we're not sexist, um, we uh, believe in justice for, uh, for all. And then finally, principle E, uh, respect for people's rights and dignity. Psychologists respect the dignity and worth of all people and the rights of individuals to privacy, confidentiality, and self-determination. So this is big issues, especially with psychology, especially with stigma that can be attached to mental illnesses, mental disorders, stigma that can be attached to personal feelings, personal ideas, uh, in research, for example. So privacy is whether or not you uh, choose to share certain information. So we respect an individual's right to determine what they want to share in terms of their information. Confidentiality, we respect a person's right to, uh, if they do share their information, for access to it to be restricted. So for example, in terms of raw data in my experiments, I have access to that raw data, but if you ask me to see the raw data for one of my experiments, I would have to say no, because that is part of the agreement of confidentiality. And also self-determination, uh, what happens to the particular individual. So, once again, in an experimental situation is the one that I'm most familiar with. Uh, subjects are allowed to leave the experiment at any time. They have that right to self-determine what happens to them. And if after 10 minutes in the experiment, they feel that they don't want to participate anymore, we respect their right to self-determination. And then uh, this is uh, another big one. Psychologists are aware that special safeguards may be necessary to protect the rights and welfare of persons or communities whose vulnerabilities impair autonomous decision making. So anybody who cannot decide about privacy, confidentiality, or self-determination, anybody who has vulnerabilities that will impair that decision, those people are specifically uh, protected. So um, there are three groups that are highly, highly protected. These are the ones that are typically known as being protected. Um, and they are people with uh, mental impairments. So if you have a mental impairment that does not allow you to uh, determine for yourself private, uh, privacy, uh, confidentiality, or self-determination, you have special safeguards. So 
What I mean by special safeguards, we won't go into too much detail in this, but if I do an experiment with uh, typical university students who are adults, uh, my IRB form is about two pages long, where I put in the details of what's gonna happen, and uh, there's about two pages of information, and uh, that usually gets approved within about two weeks after submission. If I do something with a protected group, we're talking about hundreds of pages with documentation and, and uh, protocols and everything, and we're talking about months of review to make sure that uh, these special, uh, specialized um, groups are being protected. So we have people with mental impairments. I alluded to this other one. We have children. If you're doing work with children, children, we don't allow them to vote for a reason or decide if they're going to go to school for a reason because their self-determination, um, their ability to self-determine is not quite there yet, so they're highly protected. And then the last one, I was surprised when I first read this because it's not one that you typically think of, uh, prisoners. Prisoners are a highly protected group because by definition, uh, they lack self-determination, right? So they, uh, they can't decide my prison sentence is up and I'm just gonna leave today. Uh, they lack self-determination, so whether or not they have the ability to maintain privacy, maintain confidentiality, is an issue that requires these very uh, high safeguards. All right, so um, those are the five basic principles, and again, those inform all of psychology. And then in terms of, <coughs> in terms of uh, animal psychology, because we are, we did deal with a lot of animal experiments in this, um, uh, in this course, and we are gonna see an example when we take a look at the movie of uh, animal, um, animal psychology, for example. So one of the issues that people constantly debate in terms of animal uh, rights has to do with the idea of speciesism, and this was a term coined by Singer back in 1995. And this is the idea that uh, you can neglect the rights and interests of other species. So the real question is whether or not, the question that they're asking is whether or not the rights of animals are equal to the rights of humans. And when you take a look at that, it's not, I don't know if very many people would argue that animals have absolutely no rights whatsoever. I think we as a society have come to the point where we acknowledge that animals do have uh, certain rights. On the other hand, I don't think there's anybody that would argue that animals have uh, all the rights that human beings have. Because if animals had all the rights that human beings have, then every single predator in the world would be locked up in jail on counts of murder for every single herbivore that they ever ate. So we don't arrest a lion when it eats a gazelle because we, re we recognize that that gazelle does not have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness right in, in, uh, in the jungle. So we know that it's not 100% the same as humans. We know that it's not 0%. The real question when it comes to ethics and animals is where in between? What rights do they have? What rights do they not have? We're not going to allow animals to vote, but we should allow them, you know, the, the chance to live a pain-free existence, right? So where do the rights fall and where don't they? That's an entire course on its own, so we're not going to uh, mention, to talk about that. But just so that you're aware, this is the issue. Where, how much rights do animals have? What rights do they have? And that's just an ongoing discussion that uh, continues uh, to evolve. However, on that note, just so that you know, there is an entire section of guidelines for the use of non-human -anim non animals in uh, research. And typically, what happens in research is uh, in a research setting, the animals are actually kept in a better situation than they would have in the wild. So if you do research about what animals are like uh, in the wild, they are literally, if you're a prey in the wild, 
you have two decisions to make every single day. You have the decision of, do I stay in my protective home and starve to death, or do I go outside looking for food and potentially get murdered? So your choice every single day is starve to death or get murdered. And if you think that that's a stressful environment to live in, you're absolutely right. Um, in a lab, we typically keep animals, if you're feeding animals, you have to restrict their food intake to motivate them to perform in an experiment. They are typically heavier in the lab than they would be in nature, for example. So all of these principles are again in place to protect these animals uh, and the rights of these animals. So in terms of why you're doing the research, the research has to be uh, justified to uh, a certain level. You can't just be replicating something that was uh, done before and just say, well, I'm just gonna do it again just to see if it's still gonna occur. There has to be certain levels of justification. There has to be, we'll just kind of run through this because I do want to get to the first part of the movie, but you can read uh, for some of the details. The personnel that are interacting with the animals have to be properly trained. That's one of the ethical principles as well. Uh, they need to know how to handle the animals. Care and housing of laboratory animals. They need to be housed in the correct, uh, in the correct way. People have to be knowledgeable about how they're housed. Uh, acquisition of laboratory animals. You can't just get laboratory animals from anywhere. They have to be from approved uh, places that have passed the tests and acquired the licenses uh, in order for you to ethically acquire animals from those purposes. And then just on experimental procedures, how to conduct all that, uh, there is a lot of protection there. Uh, for animals. Whoops. And there should have been protection for white dogs, but as we're going to see, there wasn't. All right, so any questions on anything that we've kind of just really quickly gone through? All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to watch part one of a movie called White Dog. So this was a uh, movie that came out uh, in the 80s. Um, and again, I, I mentioned that it is one of the most scientifically accurate uh, learning, um, psychology of learning movies that I've ever seen, except for one thing, and I'm sure you'll be able to pick out that one thing. However, what I want you to do now is I want to put you into the, uh, into the shoes of a clinical psychologist. So imagine that the owner of this dog came to you and mentioned that the dog has a behavior that they're doing that they want to decrease. And it'll be pretty obvious what that behavior is in the movie. But they have a behavior that they want to decrease. And something is causing that behavior. So pay attention to the movie and see if you can kind of pick out what that something is. And put yourself in the shoes of that clinical psychologist going through descriptions of behavior and trying to figure out the causes of this maladaptive behavior. But uh, without further ado, we will uh, begin with part one of uh, White Dog. All right, so that's where we're going to uh, end it for uh, today. So for next class, we're going to see the conclusion of uh, White Dog, so we're going to see the treatment of the White Dog, and so far, uh, we've encountered one idea that we've already seen in the psychology of learning. Uh, it was Carruthers right there was talking about spontaneous recovery and the extinction process. So when he said that can't nobody unlearn a dog, uh, he basically said uh, you've got to worry about spontaneous recovery. Sure, we could go through extinction, but there's always that possibility that that stimulus is no longer a neutral stimulus. It can recover at any point. It could recover eight years later when a German Shepherd attacks his friend and tears out his jugular. So um, the question, though, that I want you to think about for next class is that this is an attack dog. And uh, clearly, the attack dog has been reinforced for attacking people, right? That's how you train an attack dog. But you need a discriminative stimulus. Otherwise, the dog will attack everybody. So it's clear that the dog is not attacking everybody. It is operating under a discriminative <coughs> stimulus for reinforcement. When this stimulus is present, if you attack a person, you will be reinforced. When this stimulus is absent, if you attack a person, you will not be reinforced. That's why the dog sometimes attacks and sometimes doesn't. So there's a couple of discriminative stimuli that the dog is using as a discriminative stimuli for reinforcement. So your task 
before we come back for next class, is to try to analyze the behavior that you have seen this, this dog perform and ask yourself, what is that discriminative stimulus for reinforcement? And uh, we'll see what uh, we come up with next time. But uh, for today, that's where we're going to end. So next time, we're going to watch part two of White Dog. And we're also going to see how all of this harm, so the harm is accumulating, it's not done yet. Uh, all of this harm that is occurring comes back to a single unethical decision that the owner, uh, the original owner of the white dog made. And again, just highlighting that importance of ethical considerations. Other than that, we are done for today.